preach a message tonight called the ticking clock. The ticking clock. First Peter chapter four, verse seven, it reads like this. It says, the end of all things is at hand and Kirk Cameron knows it. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. I love this, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him be belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Come on, let's pray together tonight over the preaching of God's word. God, uh, we come before you tonight excited to hear your word. Lord, we're reminded of the scripture that says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand anywhere else. God, I pray we would believe that tonight. It's good to be in your presence. It's good to be in your house. Lord, I pray, God, that you would give us an urgency that would allow us to make an impact today. God, we're excited about the plans we have for the future, but God, none of that matters if we're not awake today. So God, have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Um, now, if you've been going to our church for any amount of time at all, uh, you know this uh, because periodically I'll talk about it. Um, I am not the, the handiest of men. I, I, I'm not good at building stuff. I'm not good. I, I, I'm just, I'm not very good at that sort of stuff. I get easily overwhelmed, easily frustrated. Uh, more times than not, I have to call um, some guys from our church to come help me put things together and, and things of that nature. So whenever an opportunity arises that is actually something that I can do, I get really excited about it. In, in, in fact, about a month ago, um, uh, we walked into my daughter's room, and, uh, and you know, this was kind of like she was waking up from her nap, and, and she had figured out, like, how to pull herself up. We're at the stage now where she can pull herself up on stuff. Our son, not so much. He's just not in a hurry. He's chilling. He's like, I'm, I'm chilling, right? I'm trying to be a baby as long as I can, right? Uh, but we walked into our daughter's room, and she was standing up, and, and the top of the crib is coming up to, like, her waist, and she's leaning over it, getting ready to go like WWE over the top rope. Like she's just, she's just kind of leaning on it like this. And we're like, whoa, we walk in, we freak out. And we're like, okay, it's time. We got to lower her bed. We have, to, we, have, we, have to, we have to lower her bed. And I'm like, this might be one of those moments where I can do this. So I was, I'm like, I, I, think, I think I can do this. So I, so I, I pull off the mattress and, and I look at the situation. And after assessing the situation, I'm like, I can do this. I just need that little piece. I couldn't think of the name of it. But it was that little piece that when you buy something to put together, it's like you could like put together a house. You just need this little piece. I call it the Ikea piece. It's that piece. It's, it looks like an L, right? There's one longer side and one shorter side. And it's got, got, got jagged edges all around. And I couldn't think of what it was called, but I'm like, if I just have that, I think I can do this. And it, it's that little piece that you get anxious after you put something together because you, you, like, you throw it away and you're like, should I have done that? Like, am I going to need that in the future? And I told Christina, I'm like, I need, I need one of those pieces, like jagged edges, l shape, one side shorter, one side longer. She, and, and she goes, oh, 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 that, that, that's, that's, you know, we, we have some of those in the garage. So I go in the garage, and sure enough, I find one, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing my thing, and, and, and I did it. I, I did it all by myself. I felt so proud. You can clap at that moment. You can clap. <laughs> Stop. It wasn't me. It was the Lord. It was the Lord, I, you know, working through me. You know what I mean? Right, anyway, I digress. And, and, and I couldn't think. In fact, even this morning, I was talking to somebody, and I, was, I knew I was going to share this story. And I asked some people on our team, I'm like, what's that thing called? Now, now you know that it's called what? An Allen wrench. Now, Allen must have been, like, well diversified. Because Allen can do it all, baby. Like, I mean, Allen is like, you, know, you, you ever, like, again, buy something, and, and there's all these pieces? And I'm always like, you mean to tell me to put this whole thing together? All I need is this little tiny piece. And, and you want to know what's interesting is you and I are the same way. Like if we just look at each other, if you just look at me, if I just look at you, like listen, we're not that impressive unto ourselves. Come on, none of us are like, like that amazing. None of us are that. Yeah, you got gifts and God gave you those gifts and that's great. But, but the reality is, is, is like we know us, right? 
And it is amazing yet how God uses our lives again and again and again. It blows me away that, that God takes like, you know, simple things like, like you and I, and God uses these things profoundly. Now, now, the problem is you and I have oftentimes a faulty mindset, and the mindset that gets us into trouble is when we think we have all the time in the world. Thinking you have all the time in the world will get you into trouble. In, in fact, I was, talking, I was talking to one of our, one of our single guys, this is a while back, and I, and I was talking to him, and, uh, and he was telling me about a girl that he liked in the church. He was telling me about a girl that he liked in the church. We have a lot of single people in our church. And, um, and, and uh, he was telling me about a girl that he liked that attended our church. And I go, oh, and now I'm old school. Like, I'm from the day and age where, like, if you just, like, saw somebody you were interested in, you just, like, were grown about it, and you just walked up to him and said, hey, I'd really like to take you out to coffee sometime. That's what you do. Now, this is a different day and age, people. A different world. Like, come on, for those of us in the room that are like 35 and north, I'm about to enlighten you a little bit, okay? Like, I'm about to blow your mind a little bit. And, 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 and so I asked him, I said, oh, are you going to ask her out? And he goes, no, 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 I'm going to get to know her. I, I want to get to know her a little bit first. Now, where I come from, is like, oh, that's dating. That's what you do. That's why you go out in order to get to know them. And, and he said, no, 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 I, I'm going to get to know them. And then I make a joke. I, I, I literally was like making a joke because that's what I do, right? Uh, I, I made a joke and I go, oh, you mean you're going to like Instagram stalker? Da, da, da. And he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. It's exactly what I'm going to do. And I'm like, wait, so, so she doesn't know you're getting to know her. You're just doing it in a creepy fashion. <laughs> Boop, I hit like, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, like, you're just doing it in a really, really weird way, right? And he goes, yeah, but we also hang out in the same group, and, I, and I'm going get to get to know her over some time. And I said, okay, well, how long are you going to do this for before you ask her out? And he said, oh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to wait about six to eight weeks. I'm going to wait about six to eight weeks. Some of you are doing this right now, and this message is for you. I said, six, eight weeks. I said, bro, like, what's to prevent some other, like, real dude <laughs> to just walking up to her in the next six to eight weeks and asking her out? He goes, oh, no, 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 no. Pastor, that's not going to happen. He's like, trust me, that's not going to happen. I'm like, trust you. I've been married for 15 years. You're single. No, trust me. Your way's not working. Like, like, why would we trust you in this scenario, right? He goes, no, no, trust me. Sure enough, two weeks later, I see him in church. He's like, Pastor, you're not going to believe this. I'm like, let me guess. Of course I'm going to believe it because I told you it was going to happen. She got asked out by another guy, and it's going great. Yeah. You will get in trouble thinking you have all the time in the world. You and I think we have way more control over this thing called time, and the reality is we have no control over it. Even the Bible tells us, and we know this instinctively, we don't even need the Bible to tell us, but the Bible even tells us that, listen, tomorrow is not guaranteed. This is why, by the way, I get so annoyed with the person that's always talking about the future and never doing anything in the present. I, I get so frustrated by the people that are going to do awesome things. By the way, you want to know the reason why we like doing that? We like doing it because it feeds our ego. Because we get praise and yet it costs us nothing. It doesn't cost us anything to go, in eight years, I'm gonna build this and build that and do this and do that. And everyone goes, wow, you haven't done anything. All you said is, and, and, and here's what I found to be true about life is that if you take care of today, tomorrow will take care of itself. I, I think we spend too much time thinking that tomorrow is guaranteed, that five years from now is guaranteed. And by the way, it is hurting the way we're following Jesus. And in addition to that, it's hurting the way we're sharing Jesus. And the reality is, is you and I can learn this the preemptive way, or we can learn it the hard way. I, I remember I was 20 years old when I learned this the heartbreaking way. When I was 20 years old, I got a phone call as a sophomore in college, and I got a friend. I got a phone call from one of my friends that I kind of had last touch with. I hadn't talked to him in the last few years, but we had kind of grown up together. And he called me up, and he said that um, our friend Nate, that we both had grown up with, um, had died. Same age as me. He was a year older than me. And, uh, and he said that, that Nate had died. In fact, Nate was, was killed. And he goes, man, hey, the funeral's this Saturday. You know, do you want to go? It was about 45 minutes from where I was going to college. I said, yeah, man, I'm, I'm for sure there. Now, now, probably the first 16 years of my life, there was not a closer friend that I had in my life than Nate. We grew up together. We grew up doing sports together. We grew up 
started doing drugs together at 13. You know you're close with people like that, you know? <laughs> we, got, we got in trouble stealing together. We had, a, like, great conversations. We, we saw each other at the highest moments, lowest moments. And in fact, when we were 15 years old, we, 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 got, we got caught stealing. And, and, and we both got caught, and, and you know, I, I got in trouble, he got in trouble, and like, oh, man, that was, that was dumb. And, and then at 17 years old, I gave my heart to Christ. My life was never the same. 17 years old, I made a decision to follow Jesus, and, and it wasn't that I was perfect in that moment, but there were a lot of things that instantly I'd never done again. I never stole after I got saved. I'd never done drugs after I got saved. There were things that just instantly uh, stopped. And my buddy Nate, he, he kind of kept going. And, and, and we used to steal from little places in the mall, and yet he had graduated, if you will, and now he was going into people's homes uh, with a weapon and stealing from people in their homes. And now we're 19 and, and 20 years old, and him and I have kind of lost touch. And now I'm at his funeral at 20 years old. And I, I remember having this thought. I, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember thinking, how come I never shared my faith with Nate? He never once. We would talk periodically. And, and it wasn't even that I was a bashful believer. I would share my faith with people all the time. And yet this was somebody that if you'd have told me, hey, hey, who's your best friend when I was 16, 17 years old? It would have been Nate. And I remember being at his funeral going, how come I never shared my faith with Nate? And, and to be honest, you want to know what the conclusion I came up with was this. I thought I had more time. I just thought I had more time. I, I thought I had more time with Nate. I, I thought we would have more interactions. Because I remember being at his funeral going, what's crazy is he would have respected me for bringing it up. He would have listened to me. I don't know if he would have made the decision to follow Jesus, which, by the way, is not your responsibility or my responsibility, right? We're never responsible for filling other people's cups. We're just responsible for emptying ours. And I'm like, well, why not? Because I thought that I had more time. See, I think you and I, man, we get ourselves into trouble when we think we have all the time in the world with people. And then we have these rude awakenings in which we realize, man, life is fragile, we have these moments that sober us up. We have these moments that bring us to the realization that, man, maybe, just maybe, I need to start living my life and not thinking about the times that I don't have, but taking advantage of the times that I do have. Now, this can only happen if we actually believe the story that if you're a Christian in this room, that we say that we believe. Like, sometimes, I got to be honest, I, and I'm talking about myself. This is probably, all of you are great. I'm talking about myself right now. So, so sometimes I wonder, and I'm like, Andrew, do you even believe what you say you believe? I mean, do, I mean, do you believe, I mean, all the way through? I mean, think about this. Like, if we really believed that every single person that has ever been born was born into the condition of sin, every single one of us, we, we're in this room, we, we, we have sin, we were born into that condition. And if we actually believe that, that God wanted such a relationship with us, that he wanted to get rid of the sin divide, and so he sent his son, his only son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life and to die on a cross and to bore the punishment that should have been laid out to you and I. And, and, and that three days later, he conquered sin, death, and the grave, and got up out of the grave, and the tomb is empty, and, and, and he walked around for 40 days after that, and then he ascended into heaven, and now he sits at the right hand of God the Father, interceding, praying for you and I. I mean, if we really believe that, I mean, all the way to the core, wouldn't we share that more? I mean, come on, like, if we were at Clearwater Beach and someone was drowning, would we overthink it? Oh, man, I, 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 I don't want to send the wrong flotation device out to them. Oh, man, do I have credibility with them? Will they even listen to me if I send out a flotation device to them? Oh, man, I don't want to come across as narrow-minded and only send one. If I can't send five, then I can't send any. Come on, I wonder how many times we're overthinking this. And I know some of you, you're like, I don't want to say the wrong thing. Can, can I just encourage you? I'm a firm believer in this. More, more times than not, the only thing worse than saying the wrong thing is saying nothing. There is something worse than saying the wrong thing. In, in fact, every conversation I'm in, every time, can, can I say, I, I don't care if I'm talking to somebody who loves Jesus or somebody that doesn't love Jesus, every conversation I'm in, it's like, man, I want to take advantage of every single moment because I know I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. I'm not guaranteed to wake up tomorrow. I'm not guaranteed a week from now. I'm not guaranteed a year from now. I'm tired of dreaming for the future. I want to live right now. And I want to give my life to things that really matter. I want to step into spaces. That God is clearly opening the door. Here's my point, my only point. I'm sorry, I'll be funny in just a second. 
But my, point, my only point is this, is that urgency is stirred up by a combination of impending destruction and a route of freedom discovered. Urgency is stirred up by a combination of impending destruction, everyone's gonna die, and a route of freedom discovered. I, I love in verse seven what it says. Now, 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 this is a very fascinating phraseology that Peter goes into here. He says this, he says, the end of all things is at hand. And then there's like a therefore. Now, I understand a lot of therefores in the Bible. A lot of times when you read a therefore, right, the Bible lays out like a point, and then it says, okay, and as a result of this, we are to do this. And it makes a lot of logical sense many times. Like in the scripture, you're like, oh, this, therefore, boom. And you're like, that makes sense. This one I kind of struggle with. This one is a little harder for me to wrap my mind around. It says, the end of all things is at hand, therefore, chill out. It says, therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. It, 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 you, ever, you ever have a moment where, uh, and now as I get older, I'm having these moments more and more. Uh, it, it, you ever have a moment uh, where you think this is it? Like this is the end? Like this happens to me every night at about 9.45 when I'm up having a snack with Christina watching a show and I start to have heartburn. Now, some of you're 20, you don't even know what I'm talking about right now. You don't even, this does not even compute. But, but uh, for the rest of it, uh, you ever sitting there watching a show and all of a sudden you're like, <laughs> anybody, can anybody relate so I'm not alone? Anybody, can I see, see okay, cool, there's a few of us. <laughs> I'm like, Christina, I think this is it. I think I'm having a heart attack. It's like, no, it's called Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. That's what you're having right now. That's what it is. And sometimes, doesn't it feel like heartburn's gonna kill you? Sometimes I'm like, nope, I just need chewable tums is what I need. Like, so I go to the bathroom, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm better. Th this, is why also, uh, this is why also the injury of getting your wind knocked out of you is like the worst injury for 10 seconds. It is the worst injury. Come on, you ever get your wind knocked out of you and you start writing your will in your head? You're, you're like, tell my mom I love her. Like, it's like, it's like, you just, it's a terrible injury, right? Or you ever do something stupid and you're like, man, this is it. Like, man, you just, you just want to crawl like into like a rock and like disappear. Uh, in fact, a, a while back, um, uh, I'm sure none of you just you seem like great drivers, uh, but, I, but I was pulled into our garage and I hit our garage. You ever do something stupid? You're like, why, like was, I, was it a race? Was I in a hurry? Like, why? And I remember I did, I hit the garage and I went, uh, like a little something in me died instantly. Like I was like, uh, and I got out to look to hope it was like something else. And I went, uh, I just want to lay down. Come on, we've all had those moments where you've, where you've done done stuff or, or maybe some sort of physical injury where you're like, man, like, like, like this is it. And by the way, none of those things elicited a relax feeling in me. It elicits panic. But what Peter says, he says, hey, the end is at hand. The end is at hand. So be sober-minded and self-controlled. Why? For the sake of your prayers. For the sake of your prayers. You know what Peter knew? Peter knew that there were all kinds of different prayers. All kinds of different prayers. In fact, I, I wrote down a few different kinds of prayers that probably some of us in this room have prayed. I wanted to share a couple. I love it. The first one is the Hail Mary prayer. Come on, you ever pray like the Hail Mary prayer? You're like, God, I don't even really know if you answer prayers like this, but let's see. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't think so. I didn't think you responded to that, right? Come on, the, the, the Hail Mary prayers. I, I, I love this one. This is one of my favorite kind of prayers. The get me out of this ticket prayer. Come on, you, you ever pray like God hasn't heard you in like, for, heard from you in like four years, all of a sudden, blah, blah. All of a sudden, you're like Pentecostal. You're like, should have bought a Honda, should have bought a Honda, should have bought a Honda. Oh, I didn't know I had a prayer language. There it is, right? You're just like. <laughs> here's another one. Here's another one. Stop. You're making me laugh. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here's, here's another one. Oh, I love this one. The ultimatum prayer. Come on. You ever give God an ultimatum prayer? God, if you do this, then you get all of me. God's like, wow, all of you, eh? It's a bargain. I, 
I love, I love this prayer. In, in fact, this is long. I got to read it word for word, right? This is a long one. But, and, and we do this a lot of times in our prayer life. This is the, I've already made up my mind, but can you get behind this God prayer? Come on, you ever prayed about something, but you've already made up your mind? Like you're not really interested in what God has to say? You just want, if like your pastor or somebody really spiritual asks you if you prayed about it, you just want to be able to say, yes, I did. <laughs> I did, as a matter of fact. I already made up my mind, but I did pray. <laughs> Peter talks about a sober-minded prayer. A, a, a prayer that understands, this is huge, a prayer that understands that there is a lot at stake in this life. A prayer that understands that, man, the, the, the end is near. And everybody is going to die. And some people are going to die with a relationship with Jesus, and some are going to die without a relationship with Jesus. And that ought to sober you up. And it ought to change the way you pray. It ought to change the way you live. It ought, it ought to change the way you think. It ought to change the way that you and I act. Can I encourage you, some of you, and I, I, this is not, not meant to be harsh, this is the same with me. Some of you, you were praying for people to give their heart to Christ, and, and it just has been so long that you stopped praying for them. Can I just encourage you to pick those names back up? Come on, some of you adults, you, you've been praying for your wayward sons and daughters that are 25 and 26 and 20. Can I just encourage you to pick those names back up? Come on, some of you, you have friends and you have brothers and sisters, you have classmates, you have people that you work with. And we got to be sober-minded because the end is near. Verse 8 goes on to say, he says this. He says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. It's always funny to me how people use and receive the words, I love you. Like, it's really interesting. Like, I decided a long time ago that, that I am going to mean it when I say it, but say it. I, I, I just, I use those words all the time. Like there's all the time, I, I'll get off the phone with some of our staff members and, and I'll, I'll just tell them like, hey, I love you. I, I tell our staff all the time how much I love them. I tell our church council how much I love them. I tell people in our church how much I love them. I tell obviously my kids, my wife, how, how much I love them. And it's always interesting to me how people respond to that. Like I've told some of you in our church, like, hey, I love you. It's always fascinating to me how, how, how people People respond to those three powerful words. It, 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 it's amazing the, the interactions of those words. And, and, and you ever done this? You ever text them with somebody and I love you sounds too intimate? So you hit them with a love ya. <laughs> You're like, love you. Ooh, delete, delete. A. <laughs> right? You're just like, there we go. I can, send, I can send this safely. Right? You just kind of have those moments. Those are, those are interesting words. The reason why they're interesting is because there's depth to love. the different ways to love, different ways to approach love. And, and I love that, that Peter says this. He says that we are to love how? Earnestly. That we are to love earnestly. Man, I don't want to have a bunch of people in my world that are navigating their life and I'm in their world and I am withholding love. That I'm just withholding, that, that I'm not urgent in my love, that I'm not urgent in the fact that, man, there are people in our city, there's people in this room right now that, that are, are navigating their life with no place to put their sin. See, the, the reality is every single one of us in this room, we're born into sin. And what the cross does and what the acknowledgement of the cross is it gives us a place to put the sin. And until you put the sin there, you have to carry the sin. This is why guilt and shame is attached to it. This is why you and I got to constantly be encouraging people and letting them know, hey, there's a place to put that. There's a place to put that, and that place is the cross. We are called to love people like there's no guarantee of tomorrow. What would you say? What words would you not withhold? What boldness would you walk in if you knew that this was all that you and I had? I want to have the team come up. I want to finish with verse 10. Because in verse 10 and 11, he says, he goes on to say this. He says, each has received a gift, and we are to use it to serve one another. Not for our own gain, not for our own ambition, but to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever. And ever. You ever have somebody surprise you uh, with their gifts? 
Like, like, maybe there was somebody that was a friend of yours, or maybe somebody that was a family member, somebody that you went to school with or worked with, and you didn't know, like they had this certain gift or they had this series of gifts, and, and you just had no idea uh, that, that they were good at that. You had no idea, um, or, or, or that the, you're just like, man, man, this is absolutely incredible. As, as the team comes out, um, I, I'm going to highlight somebody that, that is on our team tonight, but I also want to highlight my man Kono. Everybody wave, wave at Kono back there. He's back there. Wave, Kono, wave, wave, yeah. So Kono's amazing. I love Kono Honorado. He is um, a, a computer IT app developer wizard, okay? Um, he knows how much money you have in your bank account right now, right? He just, he, he, he's, he, he's, he's that amazing, incredible. Um, and, and Kono um, uh, has been really on our launch team uh, from, uh, from the very beginning. And it was funny because I remember one Thursday afternoon uh, um, uh, when we were just at the chapel campus. And I showed him, and Kono has like all these incredibly important jobs. I could brag about that dude for a long time. He's on our church council. I could brag about him a lot. He is literally a genius. You know how like everyone's a genius? That's not true. Like he's for real a genius. You know what I mean? Like, like he, he is legit unbelievable. And, uh, and, and I was uh, at the church um, at our other campus. Uh, this is before we even had this one. And he's just there on Thursday afternoon and he's programming lights. Like in the middle of the day, he's programming lights. And, um, and, and I, was just, I was just blown away that somebody, honestly, of, of his caliber, his skill set, I go, Kono, like, did you like used to do lights like at a, at a previous church or like, and he goes, no, he just has an aptitude, saw a need and then just jumped in. And, 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 and now he runs lights all the time for us here at Grace City Church. His wife, who was right here, Hannah, Hey, we can wave. Yeah, so that's Hannah. That's his wife, right? Uh, Hannah, again, also, like Kono, was on our launch team from the very beginning of the church. And now I didn't even know Hannah could sing. I, 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 I didn't even know that she could sing. I had no idea. I just remember at church one Sunday, this is a while back, a few years ago, um, at church one Sunday, um, she was up there singing front lines, but she was singing like background vocals. So I didn't really know if she could sing. I was like, is this like Labor Day weekend? And they just turned her mic down. Like, can she sing? I don't know. I don't know, you know, and um, I was like, oh, that's, that's cool. cool, that's cool, Hannah's up there and serving, and then, and then she started leading, like, she started leading songs, and I was like, my God, I didn't even know she could sing, I, I, I know, it blew me away, in fact, I remember our first Echo Conference, which is our annual women's conference, um, I, I remember I'm standing next to Chris Kane, and Christine Kane goes, who is that? I'm like, oh, her name's Hannah Honorado, <laughs> I knew it the whole time, I, I just, <laughs> using her gifts, didn't even know she had it in her. You know what I wonder? I'm not even talking about the other three services we had today. I'm talking about just in this room right now, from the front of the room to the back of the room, to the kids in kids' church, to the teachers teaching them. I, I, I wonder how much is in this room right now. I wonder how much is in this room right now. And I wonder how much you're withholding. I wonder how much you're withholding for whatever reason, insecurity. You don't think you have time, Wh whatever the case may be. And, and can I say this? I tried to think about, I, I tried to think of a more clever way to say this. I tried to think of a cuter way to say this without being so harsh. And if you, if you come to our church, you know that I'm not like the harsh guy, but, but this is the only way I could say it. Like, you gotta know this, you have to know this that when you withhold, other people stay in desperation. When you withhold, other people stay in desperation. Now, to be honest, I, I wish it was easier to preach. I wish I could just tell you, eh, you, you can't really make a big difference in people's lives and you can just keep doing your own thing and it doesn't really matter and just your time is your time and do whatever you want, make sure you have me time. And I, 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 I wish I could tell you that, that's just not true. In fact, even sociologically, sociologists tell us that the most introverted person will impact 10,000 people throughout the course of their life. So at minimum, you're in for influencing 10,000 people. But what are you withholding? What am I withholding? Thinking I got next year. Thinking I got five years from now. Thinking uh, in 10 years, I'll, really? Maybe, hopefully. But if you're not doing it right now, my bet is you won't be doing it in 10 years probably. But if you can start stepping out in faith and saying, God, I'm here and I'm here to be used and I need to turn up the volume on the ticking clock for how much time I think I have left on this earth and how much time other people have left on this earth. 
And God, I'm gonna give you my very best. And when I get up tomorrow, I am headhunting at my school. I'm looking for people that are discouraged. I'm looking for people that need Jesus. I'm looking for people that need to put their sin somewhere. When I go to work tomorrow, I'm headhunting at work. And I'm saying, whose day can I brighten up? Come on, when I'm interacting with my family this week, man, I'm gonna bring the very best that I am. I'm gonna bring the very best of what I got. No matter where I'm at, no matter what I'm doing, no matter what I'm going through, I'm gonna bring the very, very best. Because every time you withhold, we lose. We need you. We need you to live out of everything that God put inside of you. Come on, let's stand to our feet, Grace City Church.